Namaste. We carry on with our discussions on population ecology and today we will look at some case studies of how the population studies are actually done in the field. So, if you have any population study, it begins with defining the problem because if you have any population, there are n number of things that you can learn about the population. Your problem could be say why is this population growing or not growing or if you have two different populations, what are the factors that are leading to different growth rates in different populations or for instance, if you have a population, why does it grow in a particular season, why does it not grow in other seasons. So, there can be a number of problems. So, the first thing that we need to do is to define the problem, what are we trying to study in this case and secondly to define the population because if you have a very large population, then maybe you could take a small subset or maybe you could look at some sub populations or meta populations. So, it, you have to be very clear about what is the aerial extent, what are the animals that you are or organisms that you are considering as part of your population and what are those organisms that are not a part of your population. Now, once you have done that, there can be two kinds of studies. One is known as the problems of dynamics. Now, problems of dynamics ask the question how is a population changing with time. So, for instance, if we have a population of whales in a uh, in an ocean and these whales are reproducing, but at the same time there are poachers who are killing these whales for meat and probably the population is reducing with time. So, if you are looking at anything that is changing with time such as the population size in the case of these whales which is reducing with time, we will call it a population of dynamics because it is dynamically changing, it is changing with time. The second kinds of studies are known as problems of statics. So, in the case of statics, you are looking at a static population, there is no change happening with time. So, it asks the question what determines the equilibrium conditions and the average values. So, for instance, if you see that in your forest, you have say 40 tigers and this year you have 40 tigers, 5 years ago you also had 40 tigers, even 10 years back you had 40 tigers. So, there is nothing changing in this population. So, we are having some births, we are having some deaths, but more or less everything is getting cancelled out and the population is remaining static at 40 tigers. Now, the problem of statics in this case could be why is this population stuck at 40? Why does it not become 41? Why does it not become 39? Or you could ask the question what is determining the carrying capacity of this habitat? Why is this habitat only able to support 40 tigers? Why not more? Or you could ask the question what are the interactions that these organisms have when they have this fixed size of 40 tigers? What are their home range sizes? How much amount of territory are they defending? So, these kinds of questions will be known as the problems of statics. So, we have problems of dynamics in which things are changing with time and we have problems of statics in which things are constant with time and we are asking the question what is determining the equilibrium conditions and the average values. Now, if you have a problem of dynamics, so there is something that is changing with time. Now, to study such a change, you can follow these three steps. The first one is, you will ask the question, does the change occur in a particular time of the year? So, for instance, if we are talking about the whales that are there in the ocean, we can ask the question, when do these animals breed, when do they have the young ones and when is the time when they are getting poached. So, are these things having some amount of temporal distribution. So, you have birds only in a fixed season, probably you have poaching only in a fixed season. So, th this is the first question that you will ask. The second question is, does the change occur in a particular stage in the life cycle of the organism? So, for instance, when we are talking about poaching, are people poaching mostly the adult organisms or are they poaching the calves? Is there any change between are they poaching the male organisms or are they, female, uh, are they poaching the female organisms? So, is there any particular thing that is related to the life cycle that is causing the change? And the third one is, 
what are the agents that operate at these times or at these stages. Now, let us take another example, let us talk about some insect population. So, we are going to look at um, the locust problem in detail in this lecture. So, in the case of locust, these are organisms, these are small insects and these insects are very harmful for the crops. So, they are very prominent agricultural pest. So, uh, these organisms they will come in huge size swarms. So, there will be a swarm that can have as many as say millions of creatures. So, there are millions of insects that are coming together. If you combine their weights together, it can be as high as 50,000 tons of weight. Now, each of these insect it eats in a day uh, leaves that are roughly equal to its own weight. So, if you have a swarm that has a weight of 50,000 tons, so it requires 50,000 tons of vegetation every day just to sustain itself. Now, if you have a major pest such as a locust, you would want to know when are the times when you are getting such a huge swarm, because you do not get these swarms every year. If you were having these swarms every year, then probably most of the ecosystems would have been decimated by these organisms. So, you will have a swarm say once in every 15 years or once in every 20 years. If that happens, you will ask the question, what is suddenly leading to an increase in the size of this population? Because the population was roughly constant because of which we were not seeing any swarms for the past 15 years and this year we are seeing a big swarm. So, there is something that has changed with time. So, here you will ask these questions, does this change occur in a particular time of the year? So, if you are looking at a swarm of these insects, are they coming in a particular time of the year? So, that would give you an indication of what are the reproductive periods for this particular insect. The second is the changes that we are seeing, so we did not see a change in the last 15 years and this year we are seeing a change. So, probably that had to do something with the rainfall that happened or probably a drought that happened. So, it could be related to some climatic conditions or it could be related to say an external condition such as a predator. Probably it is possible that the predators of locust they have gone down. Now, if the predators of locust have gone down in numbers, then it is also possible that the locust will increase in their population. So, the population will, will blast. Now, in such a scenario, we can ask this question that okay, we are seeing these locusts in this particular season, but what was the stage that the predator was preferentially feeding upon? Was it feeding upon the adult insects? Was it feeding upon the nymph stages or was it feeding upon the eggs of this insect? If you ask that question, that is the second question. The change that we are occurring is that related to some particular stage in the life cycle of the organism. Or for instance, we are seeing that these and these organisms are coming with the onset of rains. So, in that case, we can say that yes, then it should be related to the adult organisms, because they are probably laying more number of eggs in this particular season. So, one is the time of the year, second is the stage of the animal. And the third one is what are the agents that are operating at these times or at these stages. And there can be a number of such agents, you can have extrinsic agents or you can have intrinsic agents. Extrinsic agents are those agents that are acting outside of the organism. So, things such as weather, probably it was very hot, with probably it was very cold, very dry, very wet. So, weather can be an extrinsic agent. So, probably it rained much better this year. So, that is why we are seeing more number of locusts. That could be an extrinsic reason or you can talk about predators. Probably the predator numbers went down because of which more number of locusts are able to survive and because of which we are seeing more number of locusts. Another extrinsic agent could be parasites or diseases. Probably uh, for the past 15 years, there were some parasites or some diseases that were infecting these uh, insects and probably uh, this year those parasites died off. So, that is very similar to the effect of predation or it, it could be related to the quantity and quality of the food that is available. Probably the locust had a very good amount of food because of the rains. 
so they had ample amount of fresh grasses to feed upon and because they were having a plentiful amount of food and this food was also of a good quality so they were able to devote much more amount of resources into reproduction so this could also be an extrinsic agent or another one could be the shelter so for instance till now you, your locust eggs were being predated upon by say dragonflies and this year after the eggs were laid there was uh, some amount of uh, leaf fall and all uh, the in all the eggs that were laid uh, they were covered with leaves so they got a shelter and the dragonflies were not able to find the eggs so this could also be an extrinsic reason or there could be th some intrinsic reasons so intrinsic reasons are things that are physiological or behavioral now when we talk about physiological reason probably there was something in the shape of hormones that was the, uh, that changed in, in in the bodies of these organisms because of which they were able to lay much more number of eggs or they can be a behavioral change in which case we can say that okay something changed because of which these organisms they just came together and when they were together they did not have to spend quite a lot of time in finding out a mate and in that case there was much more amount of mating and because of which we had a much larger number of eggs so this could also be another reason so we have seen we can say that there are a number of extrinsic agents and intrinsic agents that are acting on every population at all times now the reason for the change in your population or the reason for the for your dynamic problems could be one of these it could be more of these or it could be all of these or probably something even otherwise so you will have to look at each and every of these changes and maybe have an idea of which all changes are applying on your particular population now that is about the dynamic problems what about the static problems now if your population size is say static so you can ask the question that the population size is not changing so dynamic factors um, will uh, need not to be considered and what are the habitat variables that are responsible for the size of the population so this is the question that you can ask so how do you solve this question you can experimentally manipulate the habitat variables to look for the responsible factors so for instance you have say um, a part in the seas that is having a very high growth of algae so in this case you can ask the question that uh, and you have this whole area that is covered with the algae so you have a 100% cover and you have this 100% cover say for the past 5 years so nothing is changing now you can ask the question why is nothing changing in this area probably that is because you have ample amount of nutrients so if you try to reduce the amount of nutrients that you have in this area so probably you will cordon off this area and uh, give it uh, your this salty water that has been filtered and the nutrients have been taken away and then you will see that yes the population is declining so probably it was constant because it was having ample amount of nutrients or probably it was constant because it was not having any predators here so in that case you can try to bring in some predators so for instance you can bring in a sea urchin into this area and why were there no predators in this area because probably there was a very huge amount of wave action so in that case you can just create a a containment in this area and then you can leave the sea urchins so in that case you will come to know that yes you are having a 100% cover in this area because the wave action is not permitting you, the sea urchins to come into this area so anything can be manipulated and we do such kinds of habitat manipulations in small scales if we have to look at a problem of statics so if there is a population that is maintained at a very low level so let us say you have a forest in this forest you have say some elephants and the uh, the population size of the elephants is not increasing so let us say you have these 15 elephants and the population size has remained constant at 15 for the past number of years so now you can ask this question why are these elephants not giving birth 
or probably the the question why are these uh, these animals when they are giving birth why are the young ones not able to grow up so whenever we are talking about a static population so we have seen earlier that if we talk about the population in the nth plus 1 generation that will be equal to the population in the nth generation plus the number of of organisms that were born minus the number of animals that died plus the number of animals that immigrated into the area minus the number of animals that emigrated out of this area so population at the n plus 1th generation is the population at the nth generation plus number of births minus number of deaths plus immigration minus emigration now if we are saying that pn plus 1 is equal to pn because nothing is changing with time so we can say that pn plus 1 is equal to pn in that case pn and pn get cancelled away and you get this equation that the number of births plus the number of immigrations is equal to the number of deaths plus the number of emigrations now in the case of a closed system you can even have a situation where there is no emigration no immigration and so you can have a very simple scenario that the births are equal to the number of deaths now if the population is constant you can ask this question why is the birth equal to the number of deaths what is there in this population that is keeping it at a low level probably there are some predators probably there are some diseases probably there are some parasites probably the habitat is not good enough so the animals are not getting nutritious feed and in that case you can tinker each and every of these variables so if you think that the cause is a disease that is there in the animals you can go and check if they have these diseases so you can take say blood samples you can take fecal samples and you can look for what all pathogens are present in them you can look for parasites that are there now every organism in the wild will have some diseases it will have some parasites so probably you saw that there were three parasites that were there in this particular in most of the elephants so you have your parasite 1 parasite 2 and parasite 3 now the next question could be which of these is responsible for keeping the population at a low level so there could be one parasite because of which the calves are dying at a very young age so that is keeping the birth uh, the the death rates in the population at a very high level so in that case you can start treating these calves so you kill off all the parasites once and probably these calves are still dying off then so you can say that parasite 1 was not responsible for the high juvenile mortality that we are that we were seeing here probably you remove the second parasite again nothing happens then you treat for the third parasite and then suddenly you see that the calves are not dying so in that case you can say that this parasite p3 was responsible for keeping this population static at this number of 15 elephants so again in the case of a static problem the problem is not the population size is not changing so dynamic factors do not have to be considered so you are saying that pn plus 1 is equal to pn or essentially births minus deaths plus immigration minus emigration is equal to 0 so that uh, simplifies our calculations to quite a, a high degree and then you look for how many animals are immigrating how many animals are emigrating and in a number of cases we'll find that these numbers are are also very small or probably zero and in that case we'll ask the question what is keeping the birth rate at the current level what is keeping the death rate at the current level and then we can manipulate different habitat variables to look for the responsible factors that are keeping this population at this at a particular size so now we'll look at one such population study which is the problem of the locust now locust are certain species of grasshoppers that have a swarming phase so there is still very less amount of certainty when do you cause call an organism a grasshopper when do you call it a locust they are both very closely related organisms but mostly grasshoppers will be seen solitary but then locust will be seen in large sized swarms so they have we can say that they are grasshoppers with a swarming phase now locust are known to have these two phases so the first phase is a solitary phase and in the case of a solitary phase they will behave more like grasshoppers in which case they are innocuous they have low numbers and they do not pose a threat to either agriculture or to the habitats and then there is the second phase which is a gregarious phase 
which is a nomadic phase. So, these locusts they make large swarms. So, it is a swarming phase. So, they make large size swarms, then they move to other areas. And once they start moving to other areas, they will have a huge requirement of leaves and because of which they will become very important pest for agriculture and also for conservation. Now, this is something that we know today that these locusts are having these two phases. Now, how do you get to this understanding that this is the same organism that is having these two phases. So, this is what we are going to look at in this case study. So, let us begin with looking at these, uh, these two phases. So, in the case of the solitary phase, there are morphological differences between the solitary and the gregarious phases. In the case of the solitary phase, you have shorter size elytras which are the wing sheds which are covering the wings and in the case of gregarious phases, you have long sized elytras. In the solitary phase, you have long hide femora and you have a short hind femora in the case of gregarious phase. You have males that are 20 percent smaller than females in solitary, you have males that are 4 percent smaller than females in gregarious. So, essentially in this case, you can say that the males are very small. So, there is a huge amount of sexual dimorphism that you will see. Now, in the solitary phase, the animals are pale colored, mostly light green in color. In the case of gregarious phase, they are dark in color and solitary as the name implies, they are, have a solitary nature, they do not form groups. In the case of gregarious, they form large size groups. Now, this was known for quite some time that you are seeing these grasshoppers, you are seeing these locusts that come in large size forms and when they come, they decimate the whole of the crops. So, this has been known since, since antiquity, even if you look at the Old Testament, you will have references of these locusts that are coming and that are acting as a plague for the society. But then when people tried to look at these locusts, they found these two kinds of organisms. So, you have this lighter colored version and you have this dark colored version. And both of these look so different that for a very long period, people used to think that these are the grasshoppers that live in our uh, in the grasslands and these are the locusts that come into our agricultural fields. And they were actually considered two different species. So, now the question was that this species, you see this is this particular species once in every 15 years or once in every 20 years. Whenever it comes, there is a huge amount of decimation to the crops, there is a huge amount of decimation to the grasslands which also affects a number of other animals, especially the dairy animals. And then once these locusts are vanishing, they completely vanish off. So, you have no trace of them for the next 15, 20 years and then suddenly they, they come up again. And you do not see them in the intervening period. So, in the intervening period, you only see this green organisms. So, for a very long time, people used to think that these are two different species altogether. And the first one was named, uh, so these names are lo Locusta migratoria. So, that is the migrating species or the dark colored species, the one that we have downwards. The second one was known as Locusta danica, which is the light colored species. So, people used to think that these are two different species. So, if you start at with uh, such a, a foundation and you perform any number of population studies, you are going to be wrong. Why? So, we will come to that. So, people started looking at these differences and for a very long period, the scientists were completely perplexed what is happening. We do not see these dark colored animals for, for 15, 20 years and then they come up again in a jiffy. But then when people started doing the population studies, so we have this person by the name of Plotnikov and he started taking a uh, looking at the different uh, these two different forms and he started looking at the larva of these. So, this is an extract from his paper and he writes the most obvious difference between the two phases being in the coloration of the larvae, this character and its variability have been studied in the experiments. The larvae may be classified according to their coloration into three and not two categories. First is the migratoid category, the second is green, 
and third is dynicoid. So, migratoid is something that is related to the migratory form, dynicoid is something that is related to the, uh, to the dynic form and there is this third variety which is green. Intermediate forms also occur between all three types of coloration and the various types can usually be recognized definitely in the third larval stage. Now, as in a number of insects, this particular insect also has a number of larval stages and the differences can typically be seen in the third larval stage. Larvae of the coloration which I call migratoid have the upper side of the head black, the protunum velvety black below. So, he is essentially describing all these three different varieties. So, you have this migratoid variety, you have the green variety and you have the dynicoid variety. Now, it is important to note here that when you are looking at the larvae, you can see these three different varieties. We are not going to get into details of all these three, but then there are three different varieties that you can very easily see based on their appearances, based on their morphology as well as based on the colors. Now, just as we had seen that you have these two varieties and you can very easily make, an, make them out using their colors. So, similarly you can look at the larvae also using their colors. So, that is the first level of understanding that we get. So, this is how you, you proceed in doing any of the population study. The first thing is to look at the population and to describe things. So, he further writes, on the 29th of May, I took from an ordinary case. So, he is describing an, an experiment in this case. Now, what was the experiment? The experiment was that the scientist took out these larvae and he put these larvae into containers in different numbers. So, you can keep these larvae either solitary. So, in that case you have a container or a cage in which you have only one larva or you can keep them out in a very dense format. So, you have a number of larvae that are kept together or you can keep them at some medium densities. So, this is the experiment that he did. So, he took out these larvae and kept them at different densities. So, he describes the cage. So, that is not very important, but then he says that after a while it was observed that the larvae in the ground cage began to turn green and on the 11th of June they attained the fifth stage they had become quite green, but six of them became dark grey almost black. In the original cage all the larvae kept their migratoid coloration. So, essentially when you are keeping these larvae in different densities then you are seeing that there are some larvae that are changing their colors. Then the same experiment was repeated with larvae of dynicoid coloration and with the same result, but only green larvae were obtained in the ground cage. As many as 15 experiments with larvae of the second brood of dynica reared under conditions of over overcrowding yielded interesting results. When the larvae were kept from the first stage in small cages in jars at density of 30 to 50 larvae to 450 to 675 uh, cubic centimeter of space, a typical migratoid coloration was invariably obtained. In experiments in which the density of the population was less 20 larvae to 2000 cubic centimeter of space, besides the migratoid larvae, some green and dynicoid but not dark specimen were obtained. So, essentially if you are keeping these larvae at a very high concentration, so, in this case you are typically getting the migratoid variety and in these cases you are getting some that are migratoid, some that are dynicoid and some that are green colored larvae. So, essentially through this experiment what he proved was that both of these varieties were actually one species they are not two different species even though they look very different from each other, but they are one species. So, that was the first level of understanding. So, remember when we uh, started we said that whenever you are doing a population study you have to define the problem and you have to define the population. Now, suppose earlier I mean before that uh, before this paper whenever we had a study on the locust they only focused on the green locust or they only focused on the dark colored locust. Now, whenever you are talking about only the dark colored locus that is uh, leading to the harm to your crops, you are not defining your population correctly. 
because you are missing out all the lighter colored versions that are actually also a part of the same population. They are the same species, they are living together in the same area, they are capable of interbreeding together and probably they are interbreeding together and in that case it has to be defined as one population. If you are wrong with your fundamentals, if you are wrong with defining of your population, then the rest of the, the results are not going to proceed correctly. So, this was the experiment and he showed that both of these are the same species. Now, when the larvae were kept singly in gra glass jars, they began turning green as early as in the second stage and in the fourth to fifth stages, they invariably became quite green. When larvae in the first stage were placed in groups of four in small uh, glasses, about 100 cubic centimeter, the resulting larvae of the fifth stage presented a mixture of migratoid and green larvae as well as some transitional forms. So, not only do you have these two uh, varieties, here you get a third one. If you keep these larvae singly, you get only get the green larvae. Now, what are we getting to here? If you keep these organisms at a very low density, so there is just one organism that is having a plenty of space to itself, it becomes a green colored variety. If it is kept in a very high uh, density, it invariably becomes a migratoid variety. And if it is kept in, a, in an in between condition, then you get all these three different varieties. So, just by looking at the morphological and the color characteristics of the organisms, you should not uh, rush to say that these are, are different species. It is also possible that what you are observing is a trait that is coming out of some extrinsic factors. Now, remember we talked about the extrinsic factors right uh, before and this is one extrinsic factor. How much space do you have per animal? Now, this particular work was made used by another Russian British scientist by the name of Uvarov and he used these results to say that actually these uh, locusts are coming in two different phases. So, he said that uh, these dark varieties and these light varieties are two different phases and they can change from one to another. So, if you look at this seminal, the seminal paper that was written by Uvarov, he said that there are these two phases and he named it as phases solitaria that is the solitary phase and the phase transients which is the transient phase and then there is also a third phase. So, Phasy sol solitaria is a term to be applied to the extreme form by which the species is represented in a green in a given locality when only isolated individuals are present and no swarms exist or have existed within the last one preceding generation. Now, not only are these larvae different, but also the adults that are coming out of them, they are also different. And overall, looked at the behaviors of these two uh, these two different forms and he said that we call them as phasy solitaria and uh, phasy grega uh, gregarious and uh, the transitional phase. Now, in the solitary phase when you have these green colored organisms they will live in that particular place, they will have a large space for themselves and they have not swarmed in this generation or the previous generation then we call it a solitary phase. Then he termed the second phase as a transient phase to be applied to the form occurring in a given locality when the species is on the increase and its individuals are beginning to form loose segregation or on the decrease and the swarms are becoming loose and tend to scatter either in the hopper stage or shortly after becoming adult. And then he termed a third phase which, which was the gregarious phase. Now, in the gregarious phase, uh, it is to be applied to the extreme form to which belongs the bulk of individuals of the species in a given locality when it is forming dense and large emigrating swarms. Now, what Uvarov said was that these larvae are different, similarly the adults are also different and the as we had seen in this case that we have these three different varieties the migratoid, the, the dinicoid and the green variety. Similarly, even in the case of the adults, you have these three phases. The first one is a solitary phase. 
Now, if you have um, organisms in the solitary phase, so they will have a large space for themselves and they are going to remain in that place for a very long period of time. So, they have been solitary and even in the previous generation they were solitary. There is the second phase which he termed as the gregarious phase. Now, the gregarious phase is the phase in which most of the animals are having this gregarious nature. Most of them are the dark colored locust that we saw. So, if you look at this image, so if you have the solitary phase, you will have most of the organisms that are of this color. In the gregarious phase, most of the organisms will be of this color. In the gregarious phase, most of these animals are moving or they, ha they are forming the swarms or they are, they are starting to move. And then in between, we have the transient phase. Now, what happens is that if you have a solitary phase and the population is increasing, so the population will tend to go towards transient. If it increases further, it will tend to become gregarious. If the population is gregarious and you have ample space, the number of animals have now come down, maybe because of change in the environmental conditions. So, this gregarious will slowly turn into the transient phase and from the transient it moves to the solitary phase. So, at all times we can say that these animals or these insects, they remain in these three phases. So, you have the solitary phase, you have the gregarious phase and the transient phase. Now, when the solitary phase is, is turning into the, the transient phase, we are we call it the congregants phase because these are congregating. And when these gregaria are turning towards solitary, then the transient phase is known as a dissociance phase because they are now dissociating, they are now coming out of the swarms. And next, once you had this understanding that all of these organisms are belonging to the same species, they are the same population, then people started looking at the features of these phases. So, for instance, if you look at the behavior, the solitary do not tend to aggregate, the, the gregarious tend to aggregate there is very little mobility in the solitary phase. So, the solitary phase just remains at one place, the gregarious has a very high mobility, it makes a swarm, it moves away. Then the activity rhythm, it is not synchronized in solitary, in the gregarious phase it is synchronized, because of which they are able to form a swarm, because all their activities are synchronized, they all move at the same time. Then if we look at the adult flight, the, the solitary phase uh, flies in the night time, the gregarious phase flies in the day time. So, you can see that there are huge differences between the solitary and the gregarious phases of the same species. Then if you look at the physiology, the food and water reserves, uh, in the case of solitary they are lower, they are higher in gregarious, early mortality of the young is higher in the solitary phase and lower in the gregarious phase. The development rate is faster in the case of gregarious. So, in the case of gregarious you will have uh, less mortality of the young ones and a very fast conversion into the adults. The number of instars is also less, so instar refers to the number of larval stages that you have. So, you can see that the, the gregarious uh, phase has been evolved in a manner that it does everything very fast. So, it lays, so when it lays the eggs, then the, the, uh, the eggs have a very less amount of, of mortality, they very uh, quickly convert into adults they have lesser number of uh, of, uh, of in between uh, ages which are uh, stages that are known as instars. Then if you look at the hopper coloration, it is green in the solitary phase and yellow and black in the case of gregarious phase as we have already seen in the pictures. Then the adult coloration does not show any changes in the solitary phase, whereas in the case of the gregarious phase, it changes with maturation and age. So, the solitary one will always look green. In the case of the gregarious phase, it will become darker with time. Then the fecundity is more in the case of solitary phase, but they have smaller number of smaller sized eggs. In the gregarious phase, they have fewer number of eggs, but they have larger sized eggs. So, because you have larger sized eggs, so there is more amount of food that is available, because of which the mortality is less, because of which uh, also the development is fast and you have lesser in stars and you very quickly convert the eggs into the adults. Now, the morphology is also very different in both of 
these phases. So, whenever we are looking at a population study, whenever we are talking about the dynamics, we first began with describing the problem. So, we are studying the problem of where these locus are coming from, how does the population change. Then we secondly, we defined the population. When we were defining the population, we described all different stages. We looked at, at different life forms. Then the next stage is to look at the timings, when do they change, what is causing this change. So, another level of complexity is that even in the case of these phases, there is not a one to one correspondence between the characteristics. So, even though we are um, on the on the very blunt scale, we earlier we said that these are two different species. Then we said that these are the same species, but then there are these two phases and they have very different characteristics. But then there is a level of complexity. The complexity is that the solitary phase will not always show the solitary characteristics. It may at times show so some gregarious characteristics. Similarly, a gregarious phase will not always show all the gregarious characteristics. It might at times show some solitary characteristics. So, essentially when we looked at our computations, when we said that we have this formula that is applying to all the cases, this is a very, uh, this is a, 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 this is an extremely theoretical way of explaining things. If you look at the field situations, in a number of cases you will find things that change in the fields. So, in this case you have, uh, you have individuals with solitaria coloration and gregarious behavior. Now, this was explained later on because uh, we saw that there is a sequential development of characters. So, first of all there is a change in the behavior, after there is a change in the behavior we have physiological changes in terms of some hormones that are produced. Once you have these hormonal changes then, then the color changes and then there will be morphological changes. So, with this level of understanding we came to such a figure where we say that when there is a very high level of multiplication. So, when the numbers are increasing, now these numbers could be increasing, could be increasing because of n number of factors. Now, if for because of any factor, if they are having more amount of food or maybe a better climate, then in that case the numbers increase. Whenever there is an increase in the numbers, then the concentration of these organisms increases in the area. Now, when you have a higher concentration, so most of the larvae tend to go towards the gregarious style and once that happens you have more amount of aggregation, there is a mutual habituation and a visual compensation. So, essentially what is happening is that when you have all these larvae that are together, they are seeing each other uh, at a very close proximity, they are smelling each other at a very close proximity and because of which it leads to certain reactions which makes it into a swarm. So, the adults that form in these areas, they are also getting mutually habituated, they are also getting visual compensations, they are also touching each other which then changes the behavior. So, once that happens, you enter into this vicious cycle of the swarm formation. So, you will have activation, once there is activation there will be a change in the color, then there will be a, a change in the specific gravity, there will be morphological changes, there will be an increase in the fecundity. So, they will lay eggs more often, even though they are laying less number of eggs, but then they will lay eggs much more uh, rapidly. Once that happens, because you are having more number of eggs, then that will also lead to multiplication. So, it tends to, uh, to give a positive feedback to itself. So, if you have more locust, so more locust will lead to turning to gregarious phase. Now, if you have a, a locus or if you have a group of locus that have turned into gregarious phase, then they lag lay more number of or they will have more fecundity because they lay eggs very quickly and these eggs will also have a uh, very uh, high amount of nutrients. Now, if you have more fecundity that will again lead to more number of locust, which will again lead to, uh, to this formation of gregarious characteristics which will further increase fecundity. So, basically once this phenomenon has started, 
it gives it a positive feedback and so the, the size of the population goes on increasing. So, you trigger this population once and then it will start to explode. Now, once that happens, so there is this one phase because of which it is doing a positive feedback, then at the same time it leads to the formation of a swarm. Now, because you have a large number of individuals that are here in this place, so after a while the resources will start becoming less and when the resources are, are becoming less, so in that case these uh, organisms will form large size swarms and they will start to move from one place to another place. Now, we have seen this in the case of migration. Now, in the case of migration there was a seasonal movement of, an, of organisms from one place to another place say in search of food, in search of better conditions or to get rid of a climate that was extremely harsh. So, we saw it in the case of birds. Now, in this case this is not a migration, but this is actually a nomadic behavior. So, these locals they will move out, they are not going to come back to that same place, but they will move out in search of more and more amount of food. So, there will be emigration from this area. Now, if you have this activation, once you have this activation, there will be animals that will be going out, there will be more number of animals that are getting into the system and at the, the same time there is an increased excitability of these particular animals. So, if you have these uh, insects that are extremely excited, so in that case you will have other, uh, other behavioral changes, more amount of swarm formation and then because they are more excited they will again move into this phase and they will lay even more number of eggs because they are completely excited animals. Now, the point is till this point we are looking at the changes in the population. So, we are looking at only the biotic level changes. What about the abiotic level changes? Now, remember whenever we are talking about this population, this population is a part of some community, this community is a part of some ecosystem. So, obviously, the community is also playing some role in this population, it is also influencing it positively or negatively, the ecosystem is also influencing it positively or negatively. So, to understand this matter even fully, then people started to look at the community level interactions and the ecosystem level interactions. Now, what are the these interactions? If you look at the community level interactions, there are certain diseases, there are certain parasites, there is some predation and which is leading to some amount of changes. Now, because if this phenomenon, if it went on going again and again, because you have a positive feedback loop. So, if you have these more number of locusts, you will always have locusts that are gregarious locust. So, then what is there that will again convert it from a gregarious nature to a solitary nature? There has to be something. Now, that something will act at this stage. So, you have some community interactions. Now, these community interactions could be in the form of predation of the eggs, could be in the form of parasitism of the eggs, it could be in the form of some diseases. At the same time, there are some ecosystem level interactions in the form of the abiotic components. So, you have the influence of the weather. Now, of course, there has to be some cue that is asking these locusts to turn into a gregarious phase at some particular point of time. Now, what, what are those kinds of cues? Now, the first thing is if you ask this question, why should this locust convert itself into a gregarious phase? Now, every organism needs to, to, to leave uh, uh, more and more number of offsprings, but then we had talked about the carrying capacity, the carrying capacity or K that is there in every environment. Now, if there is a situation in which the population size is increasing. So, there has to be a larger carrying capacity of the environment to cater to the needs of the large size population. So, if you have a larger population, if you if there has to be a population increase, there has to be an increase in the carrying capacity of the environment. Now, in this case the environment consists of say food. Now, if you if you if you think like a locust, if you want to have more number of eggs, there should also be a be more amount of food that is available for the offsprings to get. 
because remember in the case of evolution we only talk about fitness. Now, fitness is not just an organism that is leaving uh, uh, that is producing more number of offsprings, but then more and more of those offsprings should also survive to the next generation. So, now you consider two locusts let us call them L 1 and let us call them L 2. Now, the L 1 locust has some genes because of which it, re, it lays a very large number of eggs in a season that does not have large amount of food. So, you have more number of eggs and you have less food. So, in that case most of these offsprings die out. So, at the end what will happen? You will have that this particular gene that was leading to this behavior, this gene will reduce in its frequency because it is not able to leave enough number of viable offsprings for the next generation. Now, let us consider L 2 that has some genes because of which it only lays more number of eggs when there is more food. Now, in that case these offsprings are able to survive better because of which this particular gene will increase in frequency. Now, through generations we will find a situation in which more and more of these genes the L 1 kind of genes they will be removed from generation to generation and more and more L 2 kinds of genes will increase in the gene pool. So, there has to be some correspondence between the amount of food and the amount of and the number of eggs that a particular organism is laying or this particular population is laying. So, evolution can occur at the level of individuals or it can, it can even occur at the level of the populations. So, if you want to have more and more of these characteristics there has to be some cue especially in the form of weather because if you have a weather in which you have more amount of moisture you have more number of plants that are growing. So, in that case the population will get this cue that it should have more and more number of eggs. So, then we come to this particular model. So, you have a favorable weather which increases the density which further triggers the gregarization phase. So, the solitary locusts are, co are converting into gregarious locusts. Once that happens you have the vicious cycle in which uh, this gregariousness increases gregariousness even further. It leads to an increased fertility you have an, an even more increase in density it is forming swarms and it is going out. And then you have the impact of predation you have impacts of parasitism or probably you have a weather condition that is not that good in that case the density would reduce. If the density reduces in that case this gregarization is then reversed. So, from the gregarious phase the locust converts into the solitary phase and this uh, whole phenomenon stops and it will keep at in, in this solitary phase till it again gets a favorable weather. So, probably it gets a favorable weather once every 15 or 20 years. So, this is when the population increases in size. Now, once you have come to that level of understanding then the next question would be how is this organism in know, able to know that the weather is favorable or not what are the kinds of cues that it is getting from the environment. So, now we are talking about behavioral ecology. The second thing would be if you have an increase in density then how does this organism convert from solitary behavior to the gregarious behavior. So, in that case now we are getting into the biochemical aspects of this ecology and this work is still continuing and so now we know that there are certain juvenile hormones that are leading to this change in the color and there are some uh, uh, some neurochrome molecules that are also leading to this change in color and we are now working on these aspects. So, whenever we talk about a population study it can be studied in different aspects. So, it you can study the static characteristics you can study the dynamic characteristics. Now, whatever you are studying you will first start with defining the problem what is the particular parameter that you want to study you will start with defining the population you will start by defining the area in which you are going to perform this study. Then will when we are uh, when we are defining the population we will characterize the population. Once we have characterized the population next we will ask what are the particular times of year in which there are these changes because of which we got to know about the weather changes. So, if it is uh, if, uh, if the size of the population is increasing because you are having more number of eggs then probably it is just before the rainy season. 
Next you will ask at what particular stage are we seeing the changes. So, in this case we are seeing the changes in the level of larvae and also in the level of adults. So, these are the two stages at which we are seeing the changes and then you try to join all of these dots together and once you have an understanding next you move on to the biochemical aspects. So, what are the, the, the specific factors that are, that are making this organism capable of sensing changes in the weather or sensing changes in the density. So, when we said that we are keeping these larvae together and they become the migratory larvae, how are they able to know this? Is it because of touch? Is it because of smell? So, people have even done experiments in which case you have one, so you have this green colored larvae, then you keep it close to a dark colored organism and then if you allow this uh, larvae to see the this dark colored organism, but it is not able to sense uh, or smell this dark colored organism, it continues to remain in a green color. So, probably because you are separating them uh, away uh, uh, using some piece of glass. So, probably this particular larva it is kept in a glass bottle and in this case even though it is able to see this uh, dark colored individuals in the surrounding, it is not able to change itself. But then if you provide some holes in this compartment, so that it is, it is able to smell the your dark colored uh, organisms in the surrounding, then it is able to change its color into a darker form, which will also tell us that there are some pheromones that are involved. So, when we are looking at these population level studies, we can get into as much detail as we want to, but whenever we are starting, you need to remember that you have to look at static versus dynamic problems and the three stages at which you will work your, with your problem. Defining the problem and the population, defining or uh, understanding the, the time of the year in which you have the changes and understanding the stage in the life cycle in which you are seeing the changes. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.